hello everyone. Welcome to this session of the Permit COE webinar series. Today, Paul McLean is going to talk about mathematical modeling as knowledge mapping in physics cell, a guided tour. My name is Daniel Tomas Lopez. I am involved in Permit COE on behalf of Embol EBI, and I am going to host this webinar. Uh, before starting, I would like to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded, including the questions and answers section, and that the recording will be disseminated afterwards. After the presentation, we will have time for questions, so please use the Q&A button in your Zoom panel for asking questions during the webinar. So let me introduce uh, Permit COE. Uh, Permit COE is the HPC Exascale Center of Excellence for personalized medicine in Europe. Permit COE focuses on a simulation of cellular mechanistic models, which are essential to translate omics data into medical actions. The performance of a cell simulation software, it's still not enough to address problems such as tumor evolution or finding personalized treatments for patients. Permit COE will scale up uh, the software for cell simulations to the present HPC exascale systems in order to enable the creation of models of uh, cellular functions of medical relevance. Permit COE will achieve this goal through a series of objectives. First, it will optimize a selected cell level simulation software to run in the pre exascale platforms. Second, Permit COE is developing a series of use cases that will showcase the application of the Permit COE products in different fields of clinical interest, such as uh, drug synergies for cancer treatments or performing multi-scale modeling uh, of COVID-19 virus and patient's tissue. Additionally, Permit COE also has as objectives training the biomedical professionals in the use of the HPC Exascale Permit tools integrating the permit communities and building the basis for the sustainability of the permit theory. Let me now introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Paul McLean is an associate professor of intelligent system engineering at Indiana University in the United States. His team, the Math Cancer Lab, develops open source computational tools for uh, multicellular systems biology, such as BioFVM for multi-substrate uh, diffusion, and PhysiCell for large-scale agent-based simulations in 3D tissues. He works closely with others to develop new capabilities for the PhysiCell platform. The codes developed have been applied to diverse problems in cancer biology, nanotherapy, tissue engineering, immunology, cryobiology, synthetic systems, and microbiology, among others. So, Paul, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for introducing me today, and thanks everyone in the audience for joining us. Uh, really excited to be with you all today and talk about mathematical modeling as knowledge mapping. It's kind of a, a bit of an overview of where what Physicel does as an agent-based model. We'll, we'll discuss what that means to have an agent-based model in a moment, but also want to kind of lay out our vision of where we think this is going to go in the next couple of years. And so very excited to share that with you today. Before we get going, I want to really thank uh, our sponsors who have made this work possible over the last several years, uh, in particular, the, the Jane Koskinas, uh, Koskinas Ted Givans Foundation for Health and Policy, who helped uh, fund a lot of the more complex and recent modeling in breast cancer and in COVID-19, National Cancer Institute, uh, including administrative supplement for last year's first hackathon for Physicel, National Science Foundation, the NCE and DOE, and Frederick National Lab for Cancer Research, and more recently, the DOD and the NIH Common Fund. So we're really grateful for that funding because none of this would really be possible without it. Um, we're very motivated um, by really taking a step back and saying that, you know, you start off with cells in a biological system and they have, you know, complex and interesting behaviors, but at the end of the day, a very limited palette of things that they actually do. They can grow, they can divide, they can die, they can change types to differentiate, they can eat each other, uh, they can sample the environment. Uh, they have metabolic you know, processes, of course. They can signal with one another by sending out chemical signals. 
Um, they can change type and mutate their properties. They can secrete chemical factors. Uh, they can move around and they have mechanics. And then of course you have cell-cell interactions uh, where they can stick to each other, push each other around and eat each other. And again, send out uh, chemical signals or uh, also communicate by contact. And somehow from this very limited palette of individual behaviors and cell in you know cell cell interactions, uh, contending with physical constraints in the environment like diffusion limits and mechanical barriers, that you put these things together and very complex behaviors start to emerge from these systems. Uh, that you have these individual cell behaviors, um, and you might manipulate those individual cell behaviors, but as you get the complex system of all these things interacting, you can get really unexpected uh, consequences. And so we want to understand and seek to control these complex multicellular systems. And so multicellular systems biology, I would define as understanding how the rules of individual cell behaviors and simple cell cell interactions in constrained physical environments uh, leads to the emergent behaviors of that multicellular uh, population. And then multicellular systems engineering seeks to not only understand that, but understand uh, how we can engineer the controls of the individual uh, behaviors and of the individual interactions to lead to better emergent behavior, something that goes from disease to health. Scientists use models to help detangle complex systems. And so model can mean a lot of things depending upon who you are. Uh, to a biologist, it might be an animal model or an, a wet lab model, like an in vitro model. It might be to a bioengineer, a, a 3D printed material or other engineering material. Uh, but for us, a model is going to be in a mathematical or computational model that we use as an abstraction, as a simplified way to kind of attack the more complex system of real biology. And so we may want to take a step back and say, what would be the ideal components of a multicellular virtual laboratory? Uh, we know that chemical diffusion is really important. And so you need to be able to under, uh, simulate uh, growth substrates, metabolites, growth factors, uh, drugs, maybe therapeutic compounds that introduce the system. And all those need to be able to diffuse and decay and be uh, sampled or uptaken by different uh, cells or secreted by cells. So we're already talking about a lot of diffusion equations. And on top of that, you need to model the behaviors of the cells in these chemical environments, uh, that their behavior, may be chemistry dependent, say based upon the level of oxygen or growth factors. So you need some kind of a molecular scale logic in the cells. Uh, you need to get the mechanical interactions of the cells at the very least just to get them to occupy the right space and uh, shapes and, and patterns. But also for the fact that we know the cells respond to mechanics, that cells that are under compression or under strain uh, may change their behavior. Uh, we also know that there's a lot of heterogeneity through populations of cells you may have a population of a million cancer cells, but the properties in the state from one cell to the next can be highly heterogeneous. They can have individual states, they can have slight variation in their behavioral uh, you know, parameters effectively, and they might have variation in their individual rules, particularly when you start modeling populations of many cell types. And so you need to be able to model these, this diversity of cell types with, a, uh, with behaviors that depend upon the environment and the neighbors around them, and that can also themselves modify and, and influence the behavior around them. So you get this complex coupling between the dynamical environment and the cells within the environment. And once you build this laboratory to, to modulate and understand and simulate you know, the chemical environment and the individual cell behaviors, uh, if you run this model once, uh, given that both the biological system and the models are highly stochastic, that's kind of like a neat demo. Uh, but it's not enough to really start concluding something about the underlying biological system. So just like in biology, you need to run multiple replicates because of that stochasticity, that variability. The same thing goes in a computational model of these environments, that for any parameter set you run, you might need to run 10 or 20 replicates and look at the mean behavior and the emergent trends over time to make sure that you haven't found some kind of statistical uh, fluke. And so you need to be able to run many copies of your model in high throughput to understand the variability and the uncertainty in your model and to be able to vary across the parameter values to explore the space of possibilities and understand uh, which rules best match your hypotheses and your observations and to spend, understand uh, which regions of parameter space lead to different overall emergent system behaviors and ultimately to identify and exploit weaknesses that allow us to control the system. So we use what are called agent-based models for a virtual laboratory. And so I want to make sure that we really are clear on what that means. An agent-based model is a model where you model the individual cells as discrete or so stochastic software agents. 
Each one of those software agents has an individual has individual state variables and individual rules that can often be written uh, in other mathematical frameworks, such as systems of ordinary differential equations or Boolean networks or other constitutive laws. And so really what happens is that the discrete agents, these cell agents, are our way of encoding our biological knowledge and hypotheses as rules. So that you have hypotheses that say how cell proliferation might vary with an, with an environmental signal or motility or mechanics or something else. Uh, then these software agents live within a virtual tissue microenvironment. And in that environment, you're gonna usually use partial differential equations to model diffusion, reaction, decay of the uh, chemical factors. Uh, there is where you might also model things like mechanical barriers, and the, really, when you get down to it, the microenvironment is our way of encoding the physical constraints upon the cell behaviors, that they have some amount of oxygen, they have so much glucose, they have so many chemical signaling factors, they have to live in some kind of an environmental stress like a drug. And so the tissue environment helps constrain the behaviors of the agents that we've encoded with our biological hypotheses as rules. Then these cells need to, these cell agents need to interact with each other and their environment. And so they'll have mechanics and other contact interactions and secretion uptake and export of diffusible substrates to get the chemical communication. And you put all this together and you have this discrete modeling framework or an agent-based model. Uh, it really uh, is very well suited for object-oriented programming if you're coming from a computer science background. So to build this virtual laboratory, we've been developing it several things over the last, well, probably 10 years now. Um, the first thing we built, recognizing that we need to talk about oxygen, glucose, metabolites, signaling factors, a drug or two, means that for many problems, you're looking at simulating five to 10 diffusion equations easily. And so we developed something called BioFEM. It stands for a finite volume method that we developed to solve a whole vector of reaction diffusion equations simultaneously uh, in 3D or in 2D uh, using systems as simple as a desktop workstation. And so we use off lot of cell secretion uptake as point sources and sinks. Then on top of that, we have reaction diffusion equations that we wrote as a vectorized system of solvers. Uh, we used operator splitting and very specialized vectorized Thomas solves to solve the Thomas algorithm for the tridiagonal systems uh, for the whole vector diffusion equation simultaneously, and then put that whole thing in an open MP parallelization loop. And that allowed us to solve pretty efficiently on uh, large like eight to 10 cubic millimeter tissues at a fairly fine 20 micron resolution even on desktop workstations 10 years ago. And the performance scaling is, is linear with the number of substrates. We found that simulating five to 10 diffusion equations on a sizable tissue is straightforward even for a desktop, uh, even for a desktop of 10 years ago. So even more feasible now. We open sourced this uh, in bioinformatics in 2016. So a little over five years ago now. Uh, and publish that as open source. And in, one of the important things is that we built this from the very beginning uh, to be cross-platform compatible. So you can take the same code and run it on Windows, run it on Mac OS, run it on Linux uh, with no changes to your code so that you can really have teams can work wherever they feel comfortable uh, contributing to a shared project. And then when it's time to go, you send it off to a cluster to do your high throughput investigations or send it to HPC to you do your really big simulations. And of course, Permit COE has been leading the way on making those really large scale versions of the software. So BioFBM is the kind of like the chemical stage, the chemical environment. And you remember we had cell sources and sinks uh, to do foster this chemical communication, but BioFBM had static cell agents. So we built PhysiCell as a layer on top of BioFBM to start adding in the actual biology. So each one of those cell point sources and sinks in BioFBM then acquired additional biological behaviors of birth, death, uh, cycling, uh, motility, uh, adhesion, and other mechanical properties. And we've been adding the capabilities of PhysiCell over the years to make it easier and easier and easier to build complex biological models, but always under the, with that with that bedwork, uh, that underlying framework of the diffusion DK code, and then the agents on top of it. Uh, we built this also to be cross-platform compatible. So the software works pretty much anywhere with no modifications whatsoever. Uh, we've also done open MP parallelization. We did a lot of work to make sure that the cost scales linearly in the number of cells rather than quadratically. Uh, and there are a lot of new capabilities I think that make it quite extensible. Uh, that we use function pointers extensively through the software, which means that you can easily attach custom rules to individual cell agents and even swap them as you're going through a simulation. You can customize any of the rules or the underlying processes uh, with custom functions, and you can have custom data to help update your model as you need to. 
And this was published as cross-platform and open source in post computational biology in 2018. And uh, we've been building on it ever since. So to kind of give you a sense of it, here's an example model here uh, with some very basic rules. Uh, first of all, we start off with a very heterogeneous 3D tumor. So they're colored from blue to yellow. The blue cells are less aggressive. The yellow cells are more aggressive. And on the outer edge of this domain, we're going to just solve a single diffusion equation for oxygen. So oxygen with a fixed boundary condition on the outside diffuses into the environment. Tumor cells consume oxygen, so that creates an oxygen gradient as they get deeper into the tumor. So as you go into the tumor, oxygen levels are going to drop, 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 drop. And eventually, if oxygen gets too low, those cells will uh, go undergo energy collapse and become necrotic or undergo kind of an uncontrolled death. So look for brown cells there. So here you see a cutaway view with a whole bunch of these yellow and blue and other tumor cells uh, shaded according to their aggressiveness. And so as a proxy of energy, we'll say that the more oxygen the cell has, the greater its likelihood of entering the cell cycle. So uh, yellow cells enter cell cycle the best, so they're the most uh, equipped to, to respond to that oxygen availability, uh, but all of them scale with that. And then when oxygen gets low, they start to die. So. Uh, and then there's also a basic, you know, inheritance here that when a cell divides, it passes on its properties to its daughter cells. So yellow cells give birth to yellow cells, blue cells give birth to blue cells. So let's watch the competition and also the mechanics. Watch the cell nuclei and see where the cells move. So as you expect, this thing is growing. Uh, you can watch the, the movement of the daughter cells as they push each other around. Here we can see that the yellow cells are the most rapidly proliferating. So they're going to build bulges of little foci in the tumor. Whereas you'll see the blue cells are proliferating less rapidly, so they're going to get overwhelmed by the yellow cells per cell. And now we can see the necrotic center of the tumor has emerged. As you go forward and forward and forward, what I find interesting is to watch the flux of cells near the necrotic part of the tumor. And you'll see that, you know, at the outside, daughter cells get pushed outward, as you might expect. But at the inside, it's mechanically favorable for daughter cells to get pushed into the necrotic core because you can either push against a whole bunch of cells this way that's densely packed, or you can push against fewer cells and push into this necrotic region. And because necrotic cells are sticking, but also shrinking, that's mechanically unstable. So you get this emergence of a network of fluid-filled chasms in the necrotic core that opens up a lot of space for that cell flux. And that's just an emergent phenomenon that comes from the basic individual cell roles and processes. And that's some, actually a pattern that we see in hanging drop spheroids with experimentalists. So you get a whole lot that emerges from very, very basic individual cell roles and really shows how um, an agent-based approach allows you to write down basic hypotheses of what a cell does code them up as rules, and then see what emerges as the multicellular system. And uh, when push comes to shove, we hope that it matches our experimental observations. And if we, it doesn't, then we say, what are we missing? We start adding in more rules and see what biological hypotheses we're missing. And I'll point out that this model is actually bundled in every physical up, uh, uh, download. And you can try an online version of this model if you go to this hyperlink where you can do the 2D version of the model and modulate a lot of the parameters and just play with and explore the model without having to download or install anything. So that might be suitable for classroom use in particular. So having introduced this overall framework, right, the, the BioFEM to study the diffusion decay of the chemical signals in the environment, you have physicel to model the agents and their behaviors, and that should be customizable. I would like to show you this uh, applied to a few research problems. So as a first example, uh, this is work with Yafei Wang, who just recently graduated from IU, um, looking at interactions, mechanical interactions, in particular between a, a colorectal cancer metastasis arriving in, some liver tissue, arriving in some liver tissue. And this work was published in scientific reports and is available online as open access. Uh, we'll make sure that you get a copy of the slides in PDF form, so you can click on this hyperlink. The idea here is, you know, a lot of people have studied from a very reductionist biology point of view, molecular biologic point of view, uh, interactions between tumor and stroma, and in particular surrounding liver tissue at a very small scale. You're saying, you know, if you have certain uh, molecules and compounds in the extracellular matrix, that that might affect the signaling uh, of individual tumor cells and their behavior. And also that might impact the, uh, the signaling on surrounding liver cells, these hepatocytes, but all at the single cell level, but not at that population level of interacting heterogeneous populations. And so we were wondering more about the larger scale effects of saying, you know, if you have a tumor growing into a liver tissue, 
that liver tissue somehow has to make way for the growing tumor if you're gonna get this a successful metastasis. And we know that the tumor as it's growing is compressing the tissue around it. And that compression should, and, and displacement of the liver tissue is disrupting it, should affect its function. But similarly, that tissue is pushing back on the tumor, it should affect the, uh, the micrometastasis that's arrived in the tissue. And so we built a model that let us explore these purely mechanical interaction effects, saying, uh, let's take some very basic biological hypotheses. Now, pressure or compression would regulate cell cycle entry by tumor cells, and that the parenchyma will model this as a, as a collection of agents, this liver tissue, and we'll use a basic plastoelastic model that we developed originally with Luigi Preziosi several years ago, uh, saying that every tiny piece of liver tissue has a, like an anchoring point, a resting position, and that as it gets displaced by the tumor, it wants to restore itself back to that original resting position with an elastic restorative force. So that's the elastic part of the model. And that allows the liver tissue to uh, give a resistive mechanical force against the tumor. On the other hand, if you keep a bit of tissue elongated or displaced for too long, uh, eventually there could be plastic reorganization on longer time scales. So the resting position starts to deform back to the cell, this agent's current position. So on short time scales, the uh, agent wants to go back to its current, uh, to its resting position. On longer time scales, uh, the plastic part kicks in and the resting position wants to uh, go to the cells or the agent's current position. And we had one last hypothesis, a very simple one, saying that any bit of normal tissue ought to have some kind of a threshold saying how much it can be deformed and for how long uh, until it just gives up and, and dies. And so we said that if it's the deformation is too long and too great that this, that bit of lymph normal tissue would apoptose and that would ultimately make some way for the growing metastasis. And so here I'm showing you a few snapshots of a typical simulation. So here we have a big bunch of liver tissue. The white dots are basically central veins. And here is a tumor that's been seeded in there. And we shade the tumor in a few ways here. Uh, blue cells uh, and green cells are the ones that are allowed to cycle. Yellow cells or tumor cells are above a pressure threshold where they shut down and arrest cell cycling. So you can see here that uh, even at two weeks, we have regions of significant mechanical pressure within the tumor that is slowing down proliferation in the center. Uh, and then as the tumor grows larger and a necrotic core emerges, that death and uh, degradation at the central core kind of relaxes in mechanical pressure. So you can see that you have a blue interior region uh, where the mechanical pressure is lower. So these cells are not pressure arrested. On the other hand, they don't have sufficient oxygen to really drive cell cycling, so they kind of end up quiescent. And so you end up with this yellow ring of high pressure within the tumor, not quite at the leading edge, but just a bit behind it, uh, where the cells are arrested, and then the proliferation activity is really on the outer edge. And that ring structure persists as the tumor grows, that you have this core, this kind of porous chasm of um, necrotic material that acts as a mechanical stress release. And then you have a blue interior ring of uh, cells that are low pressure, but also low resource. An interior annular ring where the pressure is high, so you can't, uh, you can't proliferate. Then an outer region, we have proliferation. And if you were to take a cross section of the tumor, starting at the interface and going inward, you see the mechanical pressure actually peaks a little bit behind the tumor interface and then decreases as you get towards the necrotic core. But on the other hand, the uh, disruption of the tissue propagates very far into the tissue, farther than you would expect. And so as you do expect, probably the greatest mechanical disruption is right there at the tumor interface. And then it kind of decays as you get farther and farther into the tumor, I'm sorry, into the normal tissue. And so if we compare this with clinical samples, we actually see very similar behavior. So here, if you zoom in uh, and look at the microstructure here of the, of the normal liver tissue, you see if you get very far out, it's kind of a faint pink and the liver sinus so these little uh, networks of pores between the cells uh, is a little bit more isotropic. But as you get closer and closer to the tumor, the structure kind of gets compressed. We can see the greatest compression of the liver tissue immediately outside the tumor but also propagating far into the tissue. So both of those effects that we have predicted, that you have uh, massive tissue compression right outside the outer edge uh, holds up, that the disruption transmits far into the tissue also holds up, and that the amount of disruption dissipates as you get farther into the normal tissue. So all three of those observations that we predicted in the model come out in clinical samples. 
And so then we did an parameter investigation saying, you know, let's vary the elastic force. Let's vary the plastic relaxation. Let's vary how much uh, deformation the tissue can tolerate and see what we get. And so interestingly enough, uh, we found that for certain parameter regions where the normal tissue was highly elastic and predicted a large and strong restorative force on the, uh, towards the tumor. And if the plastic reorganization was slow so that elastic force could be really sustained against the tumor, and if that elastic tissue, that tumor, I'm sorry, liver tissue was able to tolerate a large deformation, uh, then actually the whole micrometastasis could be shut down and you would have a very slow or no growth and we effectively get a dormant tumor uh, arising purely out of mechanical effects. And so we can actually explore this model yourself here at this hyperlink and try playing with these parameters. And so we thought, let's try a little experiment. We'll first go with the control case where we say, start with a dormant micrometastasis and simulate out 90 days. And you can really see that the metastasis is really slowed down. And with no modifications, just run, you know, as our control case, run that simulation another 90 days. And you can see that for very, very long periods of time, that tumor will stay small and effectively dormant. But now imagine uh, in the next idea, you take that tumor, simulate 90 days, and then you do a perturbation. You reduce the elasticity of the surrounding tissue. So the elastic force is reduced, say by aging or an injury or some other perturbation. Now that previously dormant tumor can start growing, albeit slowly, into the tissue. And so that the dormancy ends or the tumor reawakens. Or if you somehow uh, damage the liver cells and reduce their tolerance to injury, uh, now they start dying off much more rapidly. And then the pressure is removed from the tumor it can rapidly grow. So you get, a, you know, after a perturbation, so you can just simple mechanical perturbations, you can get a previously long-term dormant tumor can reawaken and rapidly grow. And this could be some tumor you forgot about from years ago, uh, but you get some perturbation by illness or by aging, and you, suddenly you get these metastases that start to take off. And so that was actually quite interesting to pop out of a really simple model. Uh, as a second use case, and I will speed up just a little bit here, we want to explore hypoxia-driven breast cancer invasion. And this work is led by uh, Eva Rocha in our lab and was recently published in iScience. And if you look at a tumor and say in a mammary fat pad uh, uh, by uh, say in a mouse model and implant a tumor and watch it grow, uh, if you really zoom in, you're gonna see that, you know, there's gonna be a central dead necrotic core as we might expect. And if you go around blood vessels, you'll see that you have pockets of living tissue surrounded by, uh, by areas of low oxygen. So here, this has been stained with something called hypoxoprobe. And so these darker cells are the cells that are hypoxic, but not yet dead. And so as you get away from the blood vessels, you get these bands of high hypoxia. And uh, our collaborator, Daniel Gilks at Johns Hopkins developed this beautiful fluorescent reporter where normal cancer cells are red, but then if they've been exposed to hypoxic or low oxygen conditions, then they will permanently change uh, color to green, which allows you to track in the long term where hypoxic cells go and what they do. And so if you look at a cross section of a tumor with all these different markers, you've got an outer edge of red tumor cells. These are cells with normal oxygen that have never been exposed to hypoxic conditions. Then you have kind of a wave of green behind them. These are cells that have uh, been hypoxic long enough to permanently change uh, color to green. And at the very tail end, you have these hypoxic cells that have not yet had a chance to respond. So interestingly enough, there's this gap between the purple, the currently hypoxic cells, and green, the cells that have been hypoxic at some point, suggesting some migration. And then you go to the very center, you get the necrotic core where everything is dead. And this correlates really with the oxygen penetration into the tumor. You have outer region has plenty of oxygen and then it degrades, decreases farther, farther, and farther, the farther you get into the tumor. So we really asked, you know, what are the rules of hypoxic cell motility? And if a cell acquires a hypoxic motile uh, phenotype, how persistent is that phenotype? Uh, if say that hypoxic cell flees hypoxic conditions, gets back to some normal tissue, will it keep the old hypoxic phenotype or will it uh, go back to, to, to old behavior? And so uh, what we did is we developed a mathematical model that models the oxygen penetration. Uh, and then we modeled the switch from normal to hypoxic phenotypes and across this uh, based on the oxygen gradient. And our simple model of signaling here was we said that red and green proteins were made you know, proportional to expression of red or green genes. And we have every cell start off with red gene on, green gene off, that during hypoxia, we would switch the gene expression. So it'd be, uh, a decay of the red protein 
and an increasing amount of the green proteins. So you kind of go from red to orange to green is what would happen here. And we also modeled that cell proliferation was controlled both by oxygen gradients and by pressure. And that um, hypoxic cells in particular would migrate chemotactically by a random walk uh, up oxygen gradients. And so uh, this is a fairly interesting problem to calibrate to data. So Aber did some approximate Bayesian computing to take a look at cell cultures of both hypoxic and normal cells, so red green cells and green cells, and use uh, ABC to fit the, the various parameters of our biased random migration, and really found that there were indeed some, some chain, noticeable differences in the fitted parameter values for the two cell publishers. So they are definitely, the red and the green cells are definitely showing differential behavior uh, in their motility. And then we varied the hypoxic, uh, basically the, 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 the persistence of this hypoxic phenotype. So at the very extreme, you could say that uh, the moment a tumor cell, the green cell, leaves hypoxic conditions, it goes back to its old behavior. And under that assumption, uh, we would get the emergence of this ring structure where all the hypoxic cells would flee just barely long enough to escape bad conditions, which means they would never have any reason to punch through the rest of the tumor to escape and invade the tissue. And so we got no evasion in this kind of, uh, in the, this assumption of this hypothesis, which doesn't match observations. So then we said, well, let's increase the persistence time so that even after a tumor cell leaves hypoxic conditions, that it retains a hypoxic phenotype for a little longer uh, for either a finite time or an infinite time. And what we found then is under that condition, uh, the longer the persistence time, the more likely they were to invade into the re red region than outside the tumor to, to go on to form distant metastases. And in particular, if you would to zoom in on these structures, you found the emergence of these green plume structures where some yellow, uh, these green hypoxic cells would tunnel through the red tissue and that would open up a mechanical path of least resistance for other cells to follow through. And it would look like invasive migration, but it was purely individual motion combined with stochasticity and mechanical weaknesses. So that was actually quite interesting. In fact, very interesting because we had these hypoxic plume structures that emerged from these simple hypotheses and those are exactly what our experimental collaborator found in her mouse model, is that not only did you have you know, green cells that invaded, but they would form these hypoxic plume structures invading into the, into the, into the normoxic regions of the tumor. Well, here's kind of a simulation that shows the emergence of these plumes as they start tunneling through the structure with some necrotic material left behind uh, if you vary the percentage of responders. And we want to point out that we tried the model in 3D to see if we got the same structures to emerge and it was a little bit more dissipated, but we did see the emergence of these plume structures also in 3D. So that was really quite nice to see. So you can explore this model yourself at this hyperlink at nanohub.org slash tools slash PC for tumor hypoxia. And we'd be delighted if you go give the paper a look, no longer preprint, it's on, uh, on iScience. So uh, that would be really make us happy if you take a look. Uh, as one more use case, we have more recently uh, developed and assembled a collaboration uh, to collaboratively develop a SARS-CoV-2 model, where we want to iteratively, you know, prototype, you know, build our current hypotheses, build the model, simulate through, and uh, explore it with our domain experts and say, what are we missing? And iteratively improve and improve and improve the model until we get to a point where we're happy. And so we really wanted to posit this as a community-driven work. So in phase one, uh, we kind of had the community building phase where our group alone kind of rapidly prototyped some basic starter models and uh, in the meantime, started uh, recruiting in a uh, multidisciplinary community and started training them up to speed on how to contribute to the model. And then in phase two, which was the current phase, we turned development over to the community and said, you guys lead us now and we'll provide support. And so we've been increasingly adding new, um, new features to this SARS-CoV-2 model. So the overall structure here is that we have a, a, a sheet of, a, of epithelial cells uh, shaded from blue to yellow based upon their level of infection. Uh, a, a virus particle would land on an ACE2 receptor on the cell surface, get internalized, uh, release the virus, and then coat the RNA, which would lead to uh, viral protein creation, viral assembly, and then exercise hosts to export that virus, which can then diffuse in the environment to infect other cells. You also have a broad variety of immune cell populations in the local infected tissue, including neutrophils, a broad variety of macrophage states, dendritic cells, CD4 positive helper T cells, uh, effector T cells, the ones that go and kill off infected cells, and fibroblasts that uh, contribute to cell scar, uh, tissue scarring. And then the interesting thing is that we coupled this with an off-screen ODE model where 
tumor cells, like say in particular dendritic cells, could leave our agent-based stimulation and appear in the ODE model to help stimulate the immune expansion, particular creation of T cells, B cells, and plasma cells that create antibodies. And then those materials can come back into the local simulation to attack the tumor cells with these multi-scale connections. This work is being led by Michael Getz, a postdoc in our lab in particular. So just kind of give you an idea of what goes into a broad coalition model like this, just for the macrophages. We have uh, 12 hypotheses right now that have been become hand-coded functions in C++ to write this model out. So it's been uh, an interesting uh, exercise to develop a large model like this. So the version one prototype just says, deposit one virus particle in the center and you can kind of see how the infected region expands out. Then as the cells get more and more infected, they're more likely to apoptose. And those are these black dead cells that we see. Version two model added random viral seeding so they can just land wherever they land and added some basic receptor trafficking. So you get these various uh, virus infected regions called plaques expanding and, and collecting. Uh, then in version three, was, things got interesting. We started adding in uh, macrophage populations. So these green cells are macrophages. When they find an infected or dead tissue, they become activated macrophages as these magenta ones that secrete pro-inflammatory factors that start recruiting in neutrophils and effector T cells. So the effector T cells are red, they go up and kill cells, and then the neutrophils are the cyan cells. Version four, which I'm not gonna show here, added a connection to the lymph nodes. And version five started adding in, in particular, the, uh, the development of the neutralizing antibodies. And so finally, this version of the model was, was interesting enough that um, you can start off with a naive infected tissue and a bunch of cells eventually get, you know, originally got killed off by that initial viral onslaught. But then you get enough dendritic cells that go off to the lymph node to train up the immune system. And the new cells coming back in, they can successfully stop that infection, uh, albeit with a good amount of tissue damage initially. Uh, but after that, this has been a fully resolved infection. But here's where it gets interesting. Uh, this system has now some memory. So if you kind of reset your epithelium, but carry over your, now your trained immune system, so all the immune parameters, and now introduce a second viral infection here, see that there will be a few cells that kill, killed, but the antibodies and the T cells and everybody else catch up right away and get very minimal tissue damage. So you see that in an earlier infection or an immunization, uh, has a protective effect against prior uh, against uh, subsequent uh, infections. And those are just emergent effects of this multi-scale model. So I want to now kind of close with some thoughts on where we're taking this modeling going forward and how we want to formalize some of the agent rules. Uh, so what we found, especially for the COVID-19 model, is that as a hand-coded model complexity grows, it gets a lot harder for any individual to understand the full model. It gets harder to communicate the current biological hypotheses. You can even forget some of the biological hypotheses. So it makes it very difficult to reproducibly write about your work. And it gets a lot harder for you to communicate with the domain experts and get them to participate in real time to, to give feedback and improvements on what you're missing in your biological hypotheses. And so our goal is to create a formalism for the agent rules where the rules can be written in some kind of a human readable plain English. Uh, and that we want to create then tools that would be make it easy to use these plain English statements, easy to annotate and import and directly turn into a model and translate it into a mathematical form. And if we can accomplish that, then this would transform the current form of modeling where you're building you know, C++ function calls to hand code your biological hypotheses into more of a knowledge mapping problem. We're saying that stuff, we're not gonna do all the brute force work anymore. We're gonna just focus our work on writing down clearly our biological hypotheses and importing the rules and simulating them with our, with our domain experts to see what happens. And so we're really kind of basing this around some ideas of communication that you can have a cell that's a sender uh, or anybody who sends a, camp, a signal and that signal can then be intercepted by someone with the right listeners or receptors for it, which then will elicit some kind of a behavioral response, say a change in cycling, death, or movement. And a lot of the statements really have very typical forms. Signaling factor X increases cell birth and cell type Y, or contact with some cell type would increase death in the infected cells. But many of these statements, you know, in a typical knowledge map, have this nice signal response type of representation. And so we're building a rule structure that says some, for some cell type, some signal like extracellular matrix chemical concentrations or a gradient would increase or decrease some behavior, which will have an associated parameter value 
uh, with some fine tuning, say with a half max or maximum response. So, and then we can map that rule directly into the mathematics with a standardized form using say Hill response functions. And so we can say that some parameter value might have a base value in the absence of signals, but then a response function like a linear ramping or a Hill response function would ramp you up towards a maximum or minimum response. And so as a simple example, your biological hypothesis might be interferon G uh, or interferon gamma promotes cell cycling. Your rule then becomes interferon G signal increases my behavior, cell cycle entry. And we could turn this into a mathematical form for varying the rate of cell cycle entry with this particular signal. And it has a nice response curve that kind of matches what you might expect. Or T cell killing, this is interesting because it turns out to be a composition of biological rules. That your biological statement might be that effective T cells kill nearby tumor cells, but that's actually three rules. The tumor cell contact increases secretion of lytic granules, that lytic granules increase cell damage, and damage increases apoptotic death. And you put these three things together and you can get T cell rules. Um, and so now we're putting, you know, advancing towards this in physicist cell, we have a new beta that just came out like this morning. Uh, so if you go to the development branch, you can get now a whole new set of standardized cell interaction behaviors, including advanced chemotaxis as a uh, linear combination of gradients. Uh, you can have cell interactions that include phagal cytosis or where cells eat each cells, um, effector attack where cells attack and damage other cells, fusion where two cells combine into a multinucleate cell. Um, and you can also get cell transformations to change, say, from a stem cell to a differentiated cell. And so to give you an example, Here's a model where stem cells divide and differentiate into differentiated cells, and the contact between stem cells and differentiated cells will control the proliferation and differentiation rates. Uh, blood vessels, these red cells here, these red agents, release resource into the environment that diffuses, and any cell that has insufficient resource can die. Uh, but now you also have colonizing uh, virulent bacteria. So they are communicating by a quorum factor, to help them find each other and form colonies around high resource regions. Basically, they start colonizing the blood vessels, but they're virulent, which means that they release a toxin that can damage and kill stem cells and differentiated cells. So you get these regions where if there are high infected regions, you can see uh, the normal cells get killed off and get this kind of an abscess that emerges around the, uh, the bacterial colony. But we do have defenders. We have macrophages, these blue cells, that will be attracted to the cell death regions, um, particularly by cell debris, and start secreting pro-inflammatory factors that recruit in effector T cells, which can chemotax, find bacteria, and kill them. Or you can get neutrophils that also chemotax and find them, uh, but kill not by damage, but by phagal cytosis or by literally engulfing the cell and eating it. So you put all these rules together, you can get a pretty sophisticated system. And with these new standardized cell interactions, it's actually pretty straightforward to build the model. And so in the future, we think that we're going to be moving towards real-time modeling, uh, thinking of it as knowledge mapping, where you would sit in a room with domain experts and together formulate be your behavioral hypotheses. Like, you say, in the tumor, you say, oxygen increases cell cycle entry, oxygen decreases necrotic death, oxygen de uh, decreases secretion of VEGF in tumor cells. So when oxygen goes low, you increase it. Uh, VEGF would increase motility in endothelial cells and maybe detachment. Uh, contact with endothelial cells may inhibit proliferation by endothelial cells. So when they lose that contact, they might start proliferating. Uh, cell debris might increase the secretion of IL-6 by macrophages. So writing out rules like these in, in plain English and in, in normal human readable statements, then to have your code immediately import those rules and simulate behavior without a need to write C++, without a need to, to recompile. You could probably do this completely in the cloud. Uh, and then get immediately working together as a team. You say, here's what your rules do. And can we get some feedback to improve our hypotheses in real time? And if you take this over the long term, I think we could develop community curated libraries of reusable behavioral hypotheses or rules so that we can transfer our knowledge from one problem to the next and truly reuse the code and have very nice and well-documented hypotheses to make your work more reproducible. Uh, I wanna make one last announcement and then turn it back over to Daniel. Uh, that last year we ran a training course. And so we have a whole lot of training materials here available at GitHub, including uh, videos and slide decks and source code. And we're gonna be running another one in 2022. And you can apply it this link down below. Uh, we've run here the last week of July, fully virtually. Uh, the morning training sessions will just be streamed lectures and anybody can attend. There's no limitation on attendees. Uh, and then after that, 
In the afternoons, we'll be, have a mentored hackathon for a more select group of participants. And so we'd be delighted if you would apply for it, and we would love to see you here this summer. And uh, I think here's where I give the control back to um, to Daniel, and we can move to Q and A. Uh, Daniel, do you do you want to step in sure. and, and run this? Yes. Well, thank you very much for that uh, super interesting talk. I mean, it's quite thrilling. Um, uh, yes, uh, uh, as Paul mentioned, uh, he has put uh, several links in the slides, and the slides will be uh, available on the permit website um, in the upcoming days, together with the recording, as for previous webinars. So from there, you will have the, the links, including to the to the upcoming course. Um, so now we have uh, some time for, for questions. Uh, as mentioned before, you can use the Q&A button to uh, ask uh, any questions you may have. So I'm going to start with the uh, first one we have here, which is how mature is SBML support import export in thesis cell? How easy would it be to import a complex SBML model from the biomodels database into thesis cell? So this is a great question. More generally, we have been developing support for a variety of intracellular model classes. Um, SBML is a really complex language, and not all SBML models are going to be compatible. But what we can say is that we do have support for intracellular models written in an SBML format using their language and their data elements, and that we support by Live Roadrunner, so it's completely straightforward. Uh, but what you need is to have an interface between that SPML model and, and PhysiCell. And so we've developed uh, and are, uh, have already developed actually in, uh, an interface where you need to say what things in PhysiCell map onto the inputs of your intracellular model, of your SPML model. Run your SPML model. And then the question is what in your SPML model maps back onto the PhysiCell agent behavior? So you need to be able to write cell cycle rates right secretion rates or uptake rates for the chemical factors. And so if you can specify those inputs and those outputs using the interface that we're developing, then we can support that SPML model. So you can't go off and import a random model off of say BioModels DB because that model may not be appropriate for a physicist agent because it needs to have an interface, right? It needs to know its inputs and outputs and relate it to the physicist model. But if you can do that, it's completely straightforward to do. We also support models in the form of uh, Boolean networks, particularly with uh, Physiboss. And that's something we've been really excited about over the years. And there are new updates coming onto that very soon. Uh, and we also are now, thanks to Miguel, who's posting here next, uh, support flux balance analysis models. And so you can actually support uh, models like that as well. And another new development we've been doing is uh, we can support uh, deep neural network surrogate models. And so if you offline, run a complex intracellular model and simulate it in high throughput to train a deep neural network, we can import that deep neural network and put it into individual cell agents. And this is again, the same thing. If you can map various state variables in physicist cell to the inputs of your DNN, run through your DNN and then map the DNN outputs to physicist cell parameters of cell behavioral parameters, we can support that as a surrogate for more complex uh, individual uh, intracellular models. So we have a lot of that support coming uh, and we'll be training some of that in our workshop here this summer. It's a great question. So uh, it is mature. It works really pretty well, um, but it has to be designed carefully. You can't just run a random model off of, off of bio models. It has to be adapted to this uh, paradigm. Um, should I click okay, the answer great. live button for that one then? I guess go on. Uh, to... I, can, I mean, I, I will take care of the... Okay, of cool. the... <laughs> no worries about that. So yeah, the next question, I'm not sure if you have already uh, answered it a bit, which says the amazing talk. Um, so creating very complex models with many biological hypotheses, this is starting to be easy, but those complex models will have many parameters. What do you think about the associated problem of fitting parameters and validating such models? So Miguel, thank you also for your great work on the flux balance work over the years. Um, that's a terrific question. And I think one of the nice approaches about uh, this kind of agent-based approach is that really we're modeling individual processes, cell cycling, cell depth, cell motility, uh, secretion and, and mechanics. And these individual processes are really closely tied to space and time scales. So cell cycling, it happens at some rate. 
these rates are biologically constrained. And so uh, the neat thing is to order of magnitude, you can already estimate a lot of these parameters uh, and get a good start. You know, cell cycling, we know is gonna be something on the order of 15, 18, 20, 24 hours. It's not gonna be a one minute process. It's not gonna be a one year process for most cells. And so just knowing the order of magnitude means that physicists cell, the primary parameters are the time scales for the processes. How long does it take? Cell volume, how big is a cell? We can measure that. Uh, how long does it take to grow a cell? Well, about the, cell, about the length of time of a cell cycle. So that gives you constraints on the, the volume control parameters. Motility, what's the linear speed? You can watch that in a microscope. Uh, or you can estimate that by paper. So most of the parameters, at least to order of magnitude, can be estimated by domain expertise and literature review. Uh, and then you can run sensitivity analysis, uh, say run the model in high throughput and vary the parameters, say which parameters actually matter the most for the behavior of this model. And those are the ones where you want to focus your experiments for fitting. Now, if you want to do really, really good fitting, then it gets very complex. Then you need to probably, you, know, you have a lot of parameters where you adjust one parameter and you affect a lot of outputs. So you need to kind of simultaneously tune your parameters. And that's where things like approximate Bayesian computing can really kick in. And those are processes that are really only enabled by high throughput and high performance computing. So um, the, work, the work here at PermEd COE is really gonna open up a new generation of parameter fitting because you can truly modulate all those parameters in real time, run enough simulations to actually run through the stochastical and Bayesian approaches to, to really constrain the parameters. But you get a great start with order of magnitude estimates and if you tailor your, your questions appropriately, that might be good enough. Uh, but if you're trying to say, I predict the tumor grows at 3.7 cubic microns per minute, plus or minus 3%, that is a much harder problem than saying, I predict that this strategy uh, does a better job of inhibiting growth than that strategy, which is more of a qualitative question and probably answerable with order of magnitude parameters. So I, I, you have to tailor your question appropriately to the level of parameterization you expect. Thanks for that. Um, we have another question. Amazing modeling. Uh, love this type of system emergence. Is someone running physical cell codes for tissue mechanics in embryo development? Not the know of, but I would love it. And we'd be delighted to help with a project like that because that would be so cool. I've seen one paper just by Google. The problem is no one tells me when they use physicels. So I don't know all these success stories. I found a cool paper by Googling where you have these purple and green cells moving around. And I think that might've been embryonic development, uh, but I'd have to look. But if you use Google for Google, uh, for physicel, look at the image results and find this really cool image with purple and green cells. I think that's the one. Um, and I would love to see more of that. Definitely. And that's already something to think about, like how to know how to get the community, how to reach the community of people who are using PC cells. Oh, sometimes. I've got an answer to that and we should put a link in, but we have a Slack workspace to support users. Uh, so come in anytime and I'll make sure I post the link uh, on our Twitter feed uh, and we'll make sure that we maybe append it to the slides for the uh, how yeah. to get help. Yeah, that's a really great point. Thank you. Definitely. Okay, uh, we have some more questions. Um, in mathematical modeling, how can we know about parameters or genes or proteins that were not known to affect the cycle we are trying to make a model for? Uh, boy, this is, feels like a Donald Rumsfeld question. These are unknown unknowns. Um, <laughs> I don't know about the unknown unknowns. <laughs> That, that's a really good question. I think, you know, we in particular are very interested more in behavioral level hypotheses rather than molecular and genetic hypotheses. And so we would start more coarsely saying, what behaviors does it take to reproduce the behaviors you see, uh, the emergent population behaviors you see in a tissue or in a collection of cells? So first of all, do we have the right behaviors? Next, um, can we modulate behaviors with the right signals? You know, we might hypothesize that, uh, that the interactions are based on a diffusing signal or on a contact signal. Now, if you've got the right behaviors modulated by the right signal, still matching up uh, the picture, then you might say, now can I identify what possible diffusing signals there might be? You might do sequitomics, for example, and look at the the, the secretions by the different cell types to say, well, here, here are the things that we know that are secreting the environment. These are the possible chemical signals. Does that match up with anything? And then you might go look in gene ontology and say, well, 
you know, what are the known receptors and ligands for those particular uh, signals to kind of tell you which cells might actually be listening, right? So this goes back to the, the sender receiver diagram. You can use secretomics and transcriptomics to say, we know who's broadcasting. You can look at the transcriptomics to say, I know who's listening. It at least tells you who's communicating. And then you can say, I know based upon the current knowledge in biology, what behaviors might be downstream of that listener, of that receptor based upon uh, prior knowledge. And you try to put those hypotheses in. It may work, it may not. To the extent that it works, fantastic, we're happy. Uh, the extent that it doesn't work, terrific, that's happy because that means we've, we're ready to discover something new. And as we start hypothesizing some new interactions that aren't in the current level of knowledge. Uh, but ultimately, it, that will lead to testable hypotheses coming out of the model that you're gonna to need to validate with experiments. So modeling here is about testing hypotheses in a sense of saying, given our current understanding, what pops out, does it make sense? It's also about generating new hypotheses for subsequent experiments. Great. Um, there are a couple more questions, uh, but as there are a few minutes left, do you mind just moving to the next slide? So people already, uh, the participants can already see the information on the upcoming webinars uh, that you can already register for in, in the permit website uh, during the month of June. So we'll have one about the uh, computer assisted functional precision medicine in cancer, one about the, the permit COE, the competency framework, how we are using it for the training and career development in the field. And also we have one about uh, HPC boost mathematical models, promises of personalized medicine. Um, so while we have this slide on here, we have uh, one more question that says, oh, I, sorry, I think we missed one. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't know if we were out of time, so I actually answered him in typing. Okay, um, so that one, uh, let me just read it just for the recording. Okay. So this is question about, is there a way to represent non-biological em environments in PC cell that is for simulating the proliferation of cells on a growth medium, for example, inside a petri dish? And Paul answers, sure, you can use inert agents that act as barriers. Uh, you can also use distant functions such as virtual walls. That's something, something that it would be uh, great to develop more. Um, we have one more question. It says, when you start to run the simulation with some initial parameter values, can these parameters uh, be affected uh, over the simulation? So for example, in the breast cancer invasion example, uh, there could be initial values for cell cell adhesion, but once time moves on and cells are exposed to hypoxia, this could affect the initial values? I love this question because to me, this is one of the most exciting parts about our modeling framework and about agent-based modeling. So anything can change at any time in response to anything. Um, that you can dynamically change the cell behavioral parameters in response to signals. And that's exactly what we're aiming for with our cell behavior language is to formalize that. And you can say that cells increase adhesion in response to low oxygen or cells increase migration in response to contact with a different cell type or an agent type or a wall. And all those are completely feasible uh, within the language of the framework. And I think that's really where the, the main work of modeling goes on. It's to say, what are those rules of how these signals, these stimuli in the environment change the cell parameters, the cell behaviors. And that, that to me is the, the most fun part about, about modeling. Okay, great. Um, let me ask you one, one uh, last question uh, myself. Uh, something uh, yeah, that we, we were thinking, uh, you mentioned about this, working with domain experts to create plain rules or rules in, in plain English that could be used. Um, how, how does this work? Like, mm. do, they, do people learn easily how to create rules? Is that something where training could be valuable or some activities? I, I, that's a really great question. You know, this is just something that we've begun as a new initiative in the past three or four months based upon 15 years of modeling, right? Um, where we've noticed the patterns that a lot of models have very similar forms. A lot of rules have similar forms. And once you see those commonalities, that's the time to start forming a language to generalize it. Um, I think you're right. It's gonna require some training to say, how do we formulate rules? And we'll take some guessing and checking and, and iteration. Uh, I think also it's gonna require tools to facilitate that. But once you have a language standard, uh, then by having that language standard, 
you're in a place where you can start writing tools because you need a day format, you need a language before you write tools. But now I would like to get to a point where we can actually have drop down menus, right? To say, choose a cell type, choose a signal, choose a behavior that's modulated, choose the direction of the behavioral modulation, and then click the little gear button and say, and here's my uh, half max, here's my maximum response, you know, and here are the, the following things to kind of fine tune that behavior. But I think that once we have the language, we can start building those, those graphical tools that help kind of help drive it forward, right? Because a completely unstructured problem is un intractable. But if we have tool, you know, a language that lends itself to tools and then tools that lends itself to a way of thinking, uh, hopefully that way of thinking isn't too restrictive that we eliminate a lot of things, but instead it's just structured enough that people can kind of start thinking about the right kinds of rules to form. And then what I'd like is if we can get to a point where those rules can be automatically parsed and turned into executable code, uh, that that eliminates the current lag that's in all modeling today. They you know, sit down with your domain experts, they tell your hypotheses, we scribble them down in a notepad, we go away and furiously code for three months, and then come back and say, hey, here's how it went. And they're like, what? What did we talk about three months ago? And you know that that time lag really is a, is a detriment to interdisciplinary work. But now we want to say, let's do the drop-down menus, try the rules, click, run, here's what it did. Oh, that doesn't make sense. Let's go change the rules. I wanted to get that to real time. To say that, you know, in one day, you can't just go through your intake interview. In one day, you might try two or three different variants of your rules uh, and record the results. And now, finally, your model will spit out your rules in a nice typed out way where you can now reproducibly and reliably say, I know what's actually in my model and I haven't forgotten something I wrote my paper. Because uh, I think that's a big problem out there too, is that the codes, when they're handcrafted, can have hidden hypotheses just by the structure of your rules and your if-then statements that don't get captured in the paper. Uh, and, and I think that's a, a, an unfortunate problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's definitely something to also to think on, like future plans, future work. <laughs> Um, well, uh, so with this, we arrived to the end of the webinar. So thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, Paul for this uh, amazing session. And thank you for all the attendees. And see you in the upcoming webinars in June. Thank you so much. Thank you all.